Hi there, Dan Siegel. Hey, John. Thank you so much for these incredible sessions. It's been uh, beautiful to be here with everyone and with you guiding us through this. Um, this is a very specific question. It came up in yesterday's session with you about frontline workers and our medical staff who are in this incredible position. Um, and tomorrow, Alyssa Eppel and Eve Ekman and I are gonna do a session with about 2000 frontline workers to try to introduce them to some of these ways we can cultivate resilience. So my question to you is given this situation now in many countries and many of our medical professionals tomorrow will be from the United States, but everyone is welcome. Um, you know, there's, there are not enough ventilators. So in their life's purpose to help people, they actually don't have what they need. And as we know, they're making decisions of life and death that are just unthinkable and the, the pain of that in them. So how to help them with that. And then it goes then to the personal side for them. There's not enough protective gear. Yeah. So they are seeing people with medical illnesses that are threatening their lives that they themselves may get. And then the third layer of the many, many layers is they're then gonna go home to their loved ones, their family and risk, um, even if they don't have symptoms of being contagious and giving vulnerable elderly who might be living with them or people with other vulnerabilities. So what uh, wisdom can And there's a fourth us? one too, is that they're being told that there's plenty of ventilators and that there's plenty of uh, personal protective equipment now and what's the big deal? Yeah. So we're living in a kind of real uh, catch-22 universe uh, that is, is, is ab ab absolutely grotesque. It's a nightmare. And, what do you and suggest? I, I really appreciate your asking this question and also a deep bow to you and Alyssa and, and your colleagues for doing this tomorrow with them. I hope you can post uh, and, and send to Soren a post where we could all like tune in because even if we can't contribute anything, just being there in some sense, although we can't be there physically, I think would be uplifting to the frontline people to know that we care and to the degree that we could have their backs, we would have their backs. But I think your question really drills down to um, the life and death dimension of mindfulness. That this is not some mm -hmm. dime store cognitive behavioral intervention that to help people feel a little bit better. This is about life and death and looking it straight in the face. No one ever wants to do that under any circumstances. And you painted the picture quite vividly. So the question is, what are the options? And the options are to go into battle and face death, either with a turbulent mind or a clear mind, and also with maintaining as much uh, cautionary control as you can over protecting yourself under uh, conditions that are not optimal. And, and that's kind of like... Um, there's no one right way to do that, but I think the more you give people a sense that that's part of the meditation practice, that's part of how you self-regulate moment by moment by no moment with no sleep and maybe not having seen your family for weeks now because you're afraid to go home and you don't want to do that or you do go home and you're paranoid about touch or how clean your hands are or what you're breathing on or whatever. Uh, and there's no simple answer to this. I mean, you know, um, it's, it's very important that we articulate the questions and ask them of each other and share the suffering and the pain and then still encourage people to, uh, that it is possible to rest in the not knowing mind, not be so uh, caught up in the fear element, which is simply, fear because we don't know what's actually going to happen. All we could talk is probabilities. It's more likely, but it's not all. And then um, trust in emergence because we can't trust in our own government speaking in the United States or in that the, they're having gotten the message soon enough to actually make it all work to optimize uh, the well-being of the people who we're depending on to actually care for ourselves. And the ventilators is another story. I mean, it's like, yeah, if you're making decisions about 
who's going to live and who's going to die? Well, you know, these are kind of battlefield conditions where they triage people in those kinds of ways. Nobody who signed up for emergency medicine or all of the people who weren't trained in emergency medicine who are backing up the emergency people really are prepared for this. So it's like, again, all hands on deck and we're doing the best we can. But I think the metaphor of not losing your mind when you most need it is incredibly important. And that that's where human dignity and why we went into medicine in the first place really, um, come, you know, it comes down to that. And it is hugely heroic and at the same time, just unbelievably human to experience the turbulence and the fear that these kinds of conditions, especially since they're so unnecessary, uh, uh, have, uh, have put us in. Is there something, John, in your experiences in the acute situation where these are not like long-term, you know, I'm motivated now, let me learn mindfulness, but now no, I am not. suffering. What can I do right now to learn these? Have you experienced that in the past where someone in an acute situation like this, um, what's the best strategy you hold to offer on to the mindfulness? The breath. You hold, I, I tell you, there are a number of them, but the, the one that I would say is, is most powerful when the proverbial stuff is hitting the proverbial fan and you're losing your mind is do you treat your breath as a kind of life preserver, okay? And you hang on to, I will even use the verb cling under these kind of conditions, uh, hang on to the breath sensations while you're intubating somebody, while you're going from one person to another, while you're making these kinds of choices, you hang on to that breath as if your life truly depended on it, not simply because it does literally, but because that's without the kind of training that, you know, in meditation that often takes years and decades to, you know, sort of, we don't have the time for that. Plus the ultimate result of that is that you, be in the present moment anyway, it's no big deal. So those years and years of practice, it's possible to basically move into that breach instantly. But the, the advice that I would give, um, if you ask me for the one thing, it would be to hang on to your breath as if, as if you, uh, there was no tomorrow and you just needed to give your full attention to whatever was in front of you right in that moment and not be so called to the distraction by fear that you lose your competency and in some sense your integrity. And that's easy to say, by the way, that's not so easy to do, but if I were in your circumstance tomorrow, that's basically what I might fall back on. Mm. Thank you, John, thank you.